Hey everyone, welcome to yet another episode of Read AI with me. Today we're going to be talking about this very interesting technique called class activation map, also known as CAM CAM. Now, this title of this paper is actually called Learning Deep Features for Discriminative Localization. From the title itself, it's a little bit difficult to tell what is going on. So I feel like right off the bat, the intuition is going to be an important emphasis for the discussion of this video. So with that being said, let's get started. So as I was saying, the title of this paper is not really directly tied up to the proposed methodology, right? It didn't say anything about class. It didn't say anything about activation. So in the beginning, I want to emphasize that for the rest of this video, I'm going to focus on the intuition, the idea behind the proposed methodology. So let's start with the abstract. In the abstract, it is said that this work is to revisit the global average polling layer proposed in previous method. So we're going to mark GAP gap as a synonym for global average polling. And it shed light on how it explicitly enables the convolutional neural network to have remarkable localization ability despite being trained on image level labels. While this technique was previously proposed as a means for regularizing training, we find that it actually builds a generic localizable deep representation that exposes the implicit attention of CNNs on an image. So the first thing to notice is generic localizable deep representation. Then we're talking about implicit attention and on an image. So first of all, I think reading from this abstract so far, the interesting thing here is it actually is tied up to representation learning, right? We're not just trying to predict anything. We're not just trying to put a label on a picture. We're trying to look into what's going on inside of the structure of CNN. And this is going to be class specific, though that we haven't seen that yet. But moreover, it's going to be image specific, which means you give me a different image. Hey, the visualization might be different, right? And the rest of the abstract is just to provide some convincing evidence that this thing is working with very little error. So let's jump right in with the introduction. Recent work by the same author has shown that the convolutional units of various layer of CNN actually behave as object detectors despite no supervision of the object was provided. Despite having remarkable ability to localize objects in the convolutional layer, this ability is lost when fully connected layer are used for classification. Let me just elaborate a little bit about the statement. So first of all, we're talking about a CNN. A CNN is based on image data, right? Let's say you have a person, that's the person, maybe that's the head, maybe that's the body. Then perhaps if you're going to train an AI that you want to recognize, okay, there's a person in the picture, then perhaps you want to recognize the face, the body, right? Let's say it's a simple world. We just want to know the face and the body. Then what that means is you're going to need to have some sort of feature extracted from the face. Let's call that square one. And then you're going to have another feature extracted from the body. Let's call that square two, right? These convolution feature are essentially squares of images. They are in a grid structure with rows, with columns, and they preserve a portion of the local information from the original image. And there are lots of fancy techniques for us to build convolutional layers like that. And you can go as deep as you possibly can. You can go as wide as you possibly can, right? So it could go this way and it could also go this way. And this architecture, we're not talking about making predictions yet. We're just talking about how do you transform features of the original picture. This architecture is called the convolution layers. And after you finish all of that, uh, you send the features into neural network and then it makes some sort of prediction, Y hat, which is an educated guess of your ground truth or your labels. So in other words, what the author is trying to point out here is whatever feature that you identify here, this square box one and square box two, it could be important, it could be not important, it doesn't matter. But as you go through all those fully connected layers, especially we're talking about this part of the structure, sometimes it could be 10, 20 layers. 
and how the information is going to go from here to here to here to here to here it's unclear okay it's unclear so that's really the problem that the author is trying to point out right which is this ability is lost when fully connected layers are used to make classification prediction task okay so let's keep going recently some popular fully connected neural networks such as nin or google net minimize number of parameters while maintaining high performance so that's like a direction right there's a problem there's a direction direction is to shrink the size right we don't want that deep of a neural network we don't want that deep of architecture we want to be clear right in order to achieve this the global average pooling which acts as a structural regularizer preventing overfitting during training in an experiments we found that the advantage of this global average pooling layer extend beyond simply acting as a regularizer and in fact with a little tweaking the network can retain its remarkable localization ability until the final layer in other words what they're saying is look you have a very complex architecture right on the left hand side of this green line you have the conv layer right on the right hand side of the green line you have the neural network layer and either part can be as deep as it possibly want and as wide as it possibly want but then what the author is trying to point out is whatever structures in the input image it can somehow be successfully retained and maintained in the last layer of the convolutional portion of this network so in other words really what they're trying to exploit is okay we don't really have to break them apart step by step layer by layer hey you know if this thing maintains to the last convolution layer why don't we just work with the last convolution layer that sounds like a great idea right and that's exactly what they did so before we jump into the historical work and the algorithm let's take a look at some motivation example here we have a couple of pictures right uh, the first picture this is gonna be a person brushing her teeth and uh, specifically we're talking about a door in the background right so here we're gonna say door and that's gonna be background and then perhaps we have a person that's foreground so this is person maybe that's gonna be foreground and then there's gonna be uh, maybe hand okay maybe toothbrush and all of that is in the foreground and then there's a label right brushing teeth that's a label representing what human believe what's going on in this picture right and that's the label if you're going to train an ai to perform at the human level then the ai better recognize there's a person brushing her teeth okay that's the number one goal and with deep neural network we did it we got it right we know the label is brushing teeth however now the problem here is how do you truly know that it's an ai trying to recognize a person brushing her teeth or simply just a bathroom door right what if this is a bathroom door what if in the training data said every door is a bathroom door then what you're building is really a bathroom door detector not a brushing teeth detector because of that problem what this paper is proposing is okay let's use class activation map let's take a look inside of neural network and let's use these highlighted heat map specifically i'm talking about this area here these are heat maps and they mark a certain area of the picture of the features that get used for neural network and specifically we're talking about for that class so in other words let me map this is for that class what does it mean it means a certain class label right the features that the ai are using to recognizing brushing teeth it's not going to be the same as cutting trees even though there could be people in the image to brush teeth and there could be people in the image to cut trees right but it's not just about the people maybe their action maybe it's about their hands maybe it's about the tools in their hands right all those things need to be considered and class activation map it's a technique to recognize those areas of the picture now here is a section of the related work usually in the past i found a little bit tedious reading previous work but recently i've actually developed this uh this latent excitement reading some of the historical work because intrinsically it really builds up this layer of 
understanding and specifically this curiosity why the authors is pointing out this motivation and point out an area of where the author got the idea for this motivation. So let's take a look. Convolutional Neural Network, CNN, have led to impressive performance on a variety of visual recognition. Recent work has shown that despite being trained on image level labels, CNNs of have the remarkable ability to also localize objects. In this work, okay, here's where it gets interesting. We show that using appropriate architecture, we can generalize this ability beyond just localizing objects to start identifying exactly which region of an image that are being used for discrimination. So in other words, I think the keyword here is beyond localization and specifically which regions of an image that are used for discrimination. And specifically, they talk about two parts of this paper, weekly supervised object localization and visualizing the internal representation of CNN. So let's walk through this part. Weekly supervised object localization. There have been a number of recent works exploring weekly supervised object localization using CNNs. Uh, for example, this guy proposed a technique for self-taught object localization involving masking out image regions to identify the regions causing the maximal activations in order to localize objects. So something like that goes like this. If I have a picture, right? I have a picture, maybe there's a person, label is person. That could be a simple task for AI to recognize, right? And the idea is, okay, how do we know that when AI look at this picture, it produces an outcome, say, okay, the probability that it's a person, it's 80%, right? So what does this 80% entail? So the technique such as what we just mentioned in the his, one of the historical paper is, okay, let's take out some of the portion of this picture and then let's replace with something else. Maybe it's informative, maybe it's not. But then let's take a look at this guess again, right? Let's see the probability of person. Is it increase or is it decrease, right? If you uh, replace a portion of the picture and you happen to stumble upon an area that the actual person is there, then we expect that the probability that this picture is labeled person to drop because the important features, you took it out, right? You replace it with something else, maybe noise, maybe another part of the picture, but the important information is gone. So if you replace important part, so then we expect this to drop maybe to just 10%. So that's the idea here about some of these previous work, which has a lot to do with resampling, replacing or masking certain region of the, uh, of the data, of the image data. And then we look at what is the final probability predicted and assigned to certain label. And we look at that probability to see if it goes up or go down. So something like that, it's quite interesting. I believe it provides certain motivation for the author of this paper to propose what they're trying to propose. So going through all these papers, what they're saying here is, however, the authors do not actually evaluate the localization ability. On the other hand, while these approaches yield promising results, they do not train end-to-end -end and require multiple forward passes of a network to localize objects, making it difficult to scale the real-world data sets. Our approach is to train end-to-end -to -end and, lo and can localize objects in a single forward pass. So in other words, what they're saying is when the previous work is going through all these model architecture and trying to generate this probability, this prediction, whatever's going on here, it's actually a question mark. What if you have a 30 layer neural network? So you have layer one and then that's layer 30. And then what's going to happen is you have an important feature here. Once you generate this prediction results, it already went through a certain path like that. What is this green path? We actually don't know, but right? that's the problem. That's the problem they're raising. If the prediction is what you're using and you're masking certain pictures, then the assumption is you already went through the architecture. How you go to that architecture, that part of the problem is unclear. So that really provides the motivation. And hence, you can say, okay, you use class activation map to refer to the weighted activation maps generated for each image. 
uh, as described in this section, we would like to emphasize that while global average pooling is not a novel technique, what we propose here, the observation that it can be applied for accurate discriminative localization is, to the best of our knowledge, unique to our work. So in other words, even though the global average pooling algorithm itself has been done before, what they're saying is this is actually a new way to use that method. And I think it's important that the authors point this out here because otherwise people are going to be like, uh, it sounds like you're just reusing something somebody else used before, right? Well, that's not really the case because it's how they're using it uh, that's bring up this uniqueness, this novelty in this proposed methodology. So I'm not going to bore you guys too much with uh, the introduction part of this technique. I'm just going to jump directly into the algorithm. So the algorithm start really from this paragraph here. So let's take a look. As illustrated in this figure, which we're going to take a look later, gap, right, global average pooling outputs the spatial average of the feature map of each unit at the last convolutional layer. And then there's gonna be a weighted sum. So let's take a look at how they design this. So given an image, there's gonna be a small f, that's gonna be a function, which represent the activation of the unit k of the last convolutional layer at a spatial location x, y. And then for the unit k, the result of performing global average pooling is this capital F. And then thus, for a given class C, uh, the input to the softmax function S is defined by this summation, which essentially, as you can see, it's just a linear transformation, right? Where this WKC, this weight parameter, is actually an indication of a feature importance for these small f's. And then altogether, uh, you can build a softmax function, which takes this form. Uh, so a softmax function basically means you have a neural network architecture and then in the end layer, the number of the total units for that last layer is going to be equivalent as number of class C. So, for example, if that's 10, then you have 1 all the way to 10. Maybe this is class 1, C equals to 1. Maybe this is cat. Okay? And that's for this unit. And this unit itself represents the class. And this whole layer, right, this type of design, it's called soft max. And the formulation is simply defined as this exponential component for a specific class over the summation of the exponential for everything, right? And that's pretty much a standard architecture if you have a multi-class classification, which basically just you want to land on that soft max function. So now we have uh, almost everything ready. We just need to map out what's going on. Here we have a figure two, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on. I'll go back to that. But what I want to point out is uh, they actually ignore the bias term um, because they believe that it doesn't really have a whole lot of impact on the prediction. So they omit that part, which is fine. And then they say, oh, okay, um, by plugging in this big F into the class score, uh, we can simply obtain essentially the idea of score for a particular class which essentially it's nothing but a linear transformation which consists of this weight, this feature importance WCK. Uh, here the C is class and this K is the unit. Or sometimes people say neuron, doesn't matter, it's the same thing. And then this small f is coming from the global average pooling. And that's pretty much all the component that the paper needs in order to propose this class score. Right? And then using this class score, uh, they can define the MC, which is the class activation map for class C. So that's the essential math going on behind class activation map. Let's take a look at the architecture. The architecture is summarized in this picture, in this diagram in figure two. Say you start with the picture, right? Here you're gonna have some original image Right? Maybe you have a person here, maybe you have a dog here, and then maybe it's a moving, moving car, right? Obviously, AI is not going to recognize all of that information, but you're just going to recognize a particular class, okay? So it goes through a certain amount of CNN, however deep as you want, however wide as you want, right? And here, land on this last layer. So here, we're going to say last layer of 
convolution layer, and then uh, it has a certain amount of matrices, right? And then these matrices we go through global average pooling. So then each of them is going to become a number, a feature. Now, for example, the blue matrix is going to come from here, the red is going to go here, the green maybe go here, right? And then they send these information into the last layer. This is a soft max. Uh, it doesn't just have to be two class, right? It could be many classes. Uh, for example, here, there are more than three. And particularly, the class we're interested in is Australian Terrier, right? So in other words, if you're going to visualize whatever, then it better be on a dot. Uh, it's not going to be on a person, it's not going to be on a window, right? It's going to be on a dot. So that's really the idea here. Um, I actually think that this diagram is still a little bit too broad, right? I am going to give you guys a very simple example that perhaps you can do in your head to walk you guys through what this diagram is about. So let's take a look. Here, let's say I have an original picture that is very simple, three by three. And perhaps I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. In order to construct the convolution layer, I need a filter. Uh, for example, maybe I have a filter one, but that's essentially two by two. And maybe this is a one, one, zero, zero. So it's a two by two matrix. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start with this corner, which is from row one and column one. And this is going to be where I start to roll over this two by two filter, right? And the convolution formula is essentially defined as one times one plus two times one plus these two are zero. So four or five are gone. So essentially plus zero plus zero. And this is going to give me one plus two, which is three. So in other words, this entire green box is going to be summarized by this number three. And after I'm done with this position, I'm going to move right a column and I'm going to be here. And that's going to give me two plus three, which is five. And then after I'm done with the row, I'm going to move down a row to row two, which is here. And then after that, I'm going to go to here, which gives me a number four plus five, which is nine. And then the right bottom corner, which is the last position, is going to give me five plus six, and that's going to be give me 11. So in other words, using this filter F1, I successfully transformed a three by three matrix into a two by two matrix. And this two by two matrix summarizes not all of the information, but the portion of the information from the original matrix. And that perhaps translate to the face of the dog or the eyebrow of the dog or the back of the dog, right? Um, that's how information gets summarized, condensed, and transferred to the next layer. And obviously, as you can imagine, I can have as many filters as I possibly want, right? And then in the end, if I call this F1, uh, maybe I can do F whatever. Let's say I do F3, then I have one, two, three. And then each of them, I can do a, a global average pooling, which is just to take the average of these four numbers, right? So it's going to be 3 plus 5 plus 9 plus 11 over 4. And that's going to give me um, 8 plus 20 over 4, which is 28 over 4, which is 7. Okay. So this is going to be my new feature. I'm going to call that X star 1. And that's how this new feature is constructed. And then perhaps I have another 2, right? X2 star and then an X3 star. I have three feature summarized from the original matrix. If you give me three filter, maybe I have a F2 somewhere here and then I have F3 here. And then in the end, I make some prediction. Y hat, that's gonna be weight number one, W1, W2, and then here that's W3. So this linear transformation using X star and using W give me this uh, educated guess Y hat. And this Y hat is going to be a prediction. Maybe it's a dog, maybe it's a window, maybe it's a whatever, right? And I'm looking at this class, let's say dog, and this class specifically give me a certain set of Ws. Let's say it's W123, that's going to be what I draw here. And then these Ws serve as a weight that I can multiply on the a two by two matrices here. So then what's going to happen is 
I am going to take this 2x2 two two matrix from filter number 1 and I'm going to put that here 3, 5, 9, 11 and then I'm going to multiply that by W1 now I have two more matrices right the second one with the weight W2 the third one with weight W3 so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stack them like this and then when I stack them I reweight them by their corresponding weight W whatever if it's the second one it's W2 if it's the third one it's W3 and this gives me a heat map so here we're gonna say heat map which looks like a picture that's blank and then there's a certain area that's highlighted and then I go back to the original picture maybe it's gonna be a person and then I stack them together it's gonna give me the original picture with the person but then here they're gonna have some highlighted green area so that heat map it's overlaid on top of the original image which is why it creates a certain visualization like this so that's pretty much the design of class activation map as you can see here right each of these matrices coming from the last convolution layer and it's reweighted by this w whatever that is pointing to the certain class and then they stack these matrices together to form a heat map and then they overlay the heat map on top of the picture which becomes something like this and this thing it's called class activation map right it's, it points to a certain class Australian Terrier and it directly looks at what kind of features are involved at generating this class so there you go that's pretty much the design let's take a look at some of the examples so here we have three pictures there are dogs uh, specifically we're talking about Briard that's a type of dog and then you can see that here the dog face is here and then it's quite clear that we are able to point, pinpoint certain area which is exactly where the face of a dog is uh, specifically in the second picture the Bria pretty much takes part of the entire picture right and then the face is uh, somewhere here so I would say it's pretty accurate right uh, we don't know because they haven't really show us all of the pictures but just based on a couple of sample pictures here that they show us I would say it's pretty good it's a decent performance right and I hear the, the dog is here the face is here and then the highlighted area is a top left corner which is exactly where the dog is so that's a good example right at detecting dogs how about the area where there are multiple locations right what if in this case the image that this AI technique is trying to detect is a barbell then barbell is not just going to be one spot of the picture right it's going to be two spots of the picture right because the barbell is this thing and this thing and then in technically speaking you have the stick holding in the middle right maybe the stick is just unclear right you can't really see it but at least you can see the barbell right so that translates to this area this area and this area so i would say it's already pretty good right this is already pretty good and then there are a couple of new interesting pictures here uh, here we have a uh, dome now here is a a little bit more advanced picture than the previous one I show you in figure 3 um, the interesting thing about this picture is the ground truth of the picture it's actually the dome it's not palace it's not church even though there are churches and palaces that have dome on top of it right so in other words really what they're trying to explain here is even though the class has multiple features associated and correlated perhaps with another class somehow the class activation map is still able to detect the difference right how do they explain this part well the ground truth is a dome right it's not palace it's not church it's not altar it's not monastery it's dome so in other words the highlight better be just on the top of the building construction which is this area right so if you look at the class of dome and you look at the class activation map then it's this area so I will say this is fairly precise right it's quite precise and if you look at other classes for example palace for example church altar monastery then it takes the body into consideration but that's not the case for the dome because dome has nothing to do with the body 
even though DOM can be an occurrence and can be an important feature of palace, of church, of altar. So this small detail discrimination is what I would consider and something truly fantastic that this cam is bringing on the table. And then in the end, they provide a couple of tables to present you with validation error amongst different methodologies, uh, which I will say, which you can take it as a reference. But in reality, I will say that the performance is probably data dependent, right? So here I want you to pay attention that this is data dependent. If I give you a different data, then obviously the performance is not going to be exactly the same, right? Then that requires a separate conversation that requires a separate simulation. So that's pretty much all I want to cover with this paper. I don't want to take too much of you guys' time. Uh, in the end, I believe they have a couple of other examples. Uh, what I want to point out is here they're raising the class activation map with object detection, right? Um, so obviously this is going to be a mistake, right? Uh, apron, that looks good, that looks good. Apron, that's probably going to be a little bit problematic. So as you can see, this technique also depends on how well your model is doing, right? So if you have a poor model and maybe you have insufficient data, uh, somehow it's not predicting accurately, then we're not going to see anything here. We're not going to see in too much pattern there, um, which is something important to, to keep in mind. If you're a researcher, you're trying to use this technique, I would say something like that is going to be important, right? Specifically, the deep CNN, it's a whole family of models, right? There's a VGG16, there's a VGG19, right? There's a Google Net, right? There is DenseNet. There are so many of them, right? There's also MobileNet. There are all these models. So it's unclear which one of them you should choose, right? I will say that's probably dependent on the model, dependent on the data, dependent on the particular task. So there you go. I hope you liked today's episode. Hopefully, through the lens of this video and this discussion, uh, you get a little bit of peek of what's going on when people want to look inside of a convolutional neural network and get a little bit of understanding how AI makes its prediction. So if you like the video, hit that subscribe button, give it a like. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next episode.